Well, I've been uh, I've been reading a proverb, uh, a chapter of Proverbs a day. And uh, do you ever find yourself reading parts of the Bible and you just think, what in the world does this have to do with me? Do you ever? I, I found myself quite a few times, and I thought it might be helpful if I looked at some of the Proverbs that, that I've been reading through and kind of helped you guys to apply it to what you have going on. So I, I'm assuming at this point that nobody knows anything about, anything about Proverbs, so that way nobody feels excluded, okay? Uh, Proverbs is a book. Uh, in the Bible, uh, it has a bunch of sayings in it, and it's about 31 chapters long. It's about right smack dab in the middle. That's about all you need to know. <laughs> There's no plot going on. It's just uh, just things you need to know. So does anyone know what a proverb is? A wisdom saying. That's a good That's a good definition. Yeah, we can go with that. Anybody else have something? Because I think that's good enough. I mean, Okay. So d does anybody, can anybody think of a modern-day proverb? A modern day proverb, one that one that is used nowadays. Not at the top of your head, huh? Yeah, I should have given you guys time to prep, huh? Not a <laughs> well, uh, well, before you start going off on that, Damien, hold on, I'll give you one, okay? Don't you you, you keep that arrow in the quiver. Uh, the grass is always greener on the other side. That would be a modern day proverb, okay? So. Now that we all know what a proverb is, there's a few things we need to look at before we look at the specific uh, proverbs. So uh, first thing to say about uh, proverbs, uh, a, a proverb is generally speaking a principle proven true over time. So it's, it's, there, there's two things that a proverb is not. The first thing that a proverb is not is it is not a promise. Um, I know uh, a lot of people who, who quote different proverbs like the one that says, uh, if you uh, uh, spare the rod, or I'm sorry, I'm saying that one wrong. I'm confusing it with the other one. Spare the rod and spoil the child. That's not the one I'm talking about. The one where it says that if you discipline a child in the way that they should go, when they're older, they won't depart from it. And I've heard a lot of Christians who, who claim that as a promise on their kids that, you know, as long as they basically give their kids spankings, their kids will be Christians until the day that they, that they die. No, <laughs> no. Uh, no, uh, it, it's, it's more than, first off, disciplining your child is more than spankings. It's more of uh, being an example and taking the time to explain things to them, teaching them by example, by words, so on and so forth. Uh, and then the second thing to that is um, it's not actually really talking about their faith. It's talking about how they live. If you take the time to teach your children when they're younger, as they're um, to be mature or to be financial savvy, as they get older, they'll stick with that as the established pattern in their lifestyle. So it's not a promise. Um, and the second thing about the Proverbs, and I know this is kind of maybe a little bit not what you're wanting. We'll get to the Proverbs in just a second. Uh, the second thing that the Proverbs are not is they are not commands. Thou shalt do this. Thou shalt not do this. Um, if, for instance, there's a proverb that says not to co-sign on a loan. Okay? So if you co-sign on a loan, it, it doesn't mean you're going to go to hell. It's not a sin. You're not... You're not you know, you're not, it, you don't need to go and, re well, you might need to repent from stupidity, but, <laughs> but I mean, <laughs> right, right. It's, it's sound advice. And uh, basically, if you co-sign on a loan, you're putting yourself at risk needlessly. The Bible advises you not to do that. <laughs> and uh, I would go a step further and say, you know, I've never actually seen somebody co-sign on a loan and it didn't go badly for them down the road. So <laughs> it happens, you know, but Proverbs are not promises. They are not commands. Proverbs aren't about what is right and wrong. Okay, If you want to know about what's right and wrong, read the New Testament, read the law. Those kinds of things give you an idea of that. Proverbs is not about that. Proverbs is about what is foolish versus what is wise. I'll give you an example, okay? Is it wrong to go on a date with a girl? No. Is it wrong to go on a date alone with a girl? Is it a sin to go on a date with a girl at night by yourself? No. Is it wrong to go on a date with a girl at night by yourself in a dark alley when you're parking? No. We still have not entered the realm of sin yet, but we have entered the realm of foolishness. You are setting yourself up for failure. <laughs> you're going somewhere where there's no accountability. You know what's going to happen. And then when it does happen, then it will be a sin. You see what I'm saying? But all the way leading up to it. And so this is what kids do, if you guys have ever been kids before. Well, this isn't wrong, 
this isn't a sin. Well, yeah, you're right. It's not a sin, but it's not wise. Okay, so that's kind of that's kind of what Proverbs is focused on. It's not focused on right and wrong. It's focused on wise or not so wise. And okay, so now let's look at some specific Proverbs. Um, the first book, the first part of the book, just kind of looks at um, why you should be wise and the effects of of, of getting wisdom, all that kind of stuff. But then about Proverbs 10, it starts going into individual Proverbs, and it just starts listing them one after another. And it goes through all the way to like the end of like chapter 29 or so, and then the last two chapters are more about the sayings of the wise and the the wise woman and that kind of stuff. So let, let's start by looking at Proverbs 10, 15. The wealth of the rich is his fortified city. The poverty of the poor is their, is their destruction. So obviously... When we look at this proverb, we can say, okay, this is a proverb that is talking about rich people and poor people. Okay, that makes sense. You know, uh, for people who are, who are rich, they can hide behind their wealth, but people who are poor, they have nothing to lean back on. They have health problems. They have, you know, different problems with the law, and they have nothing, they have nothing to lean back on. So, you know, that's pretty, pretty straightforward. But um, it goes a little bit deeper than that, too. There's, there's also a, a principle of wealth that he's talking about. If you prepare yourself now with prayer, with reading the Bible, with worshiping, with having godly relationships and that kind of stuff, you will have struggles that come later on, and you will have losing situations that you don't know how to solve. When those problems come, because they are going to come, the wealth that you have stored up, you have, you have stored this wealth, it will protect you from despair and giving up. And another thing it will do is it will prevent you from making foolish and rash decisions. If right now you're not going through any problems and you start reading the Bible and praying and you're really starting to build your relationship with God, eventually there's going to be bad things that happen. And when they do, you will be like the rich person who's able to have a fortified city with their wealth. You've stored up the wealth for the rainy day. Well, then when those bad things happen, you have something to lean, lean on. You have friendships that are godly that you can go to. You have uh, the, the scriptures that you've been studying that, that, have, that apply to the things that you're talking about. Um, when, I, when I lost my, um, my son, when, he, when, he, my, when my son died, I was going through a time when I wasn't uh, reading the Bible very much at all. And so as a result, I didn't have much to comfort me. Well, so then as I was going through my grieving process, I started reading the Bible again. And uh, I, there was a lot of stuff that came out and spoke to me in my specific situation. Now, had I been studying and building up my wealth before, it would have been like a fortified city to me. But I was like the poor man who, who it was just destruction that came. So uh, I'll give you a, a, a few examples. There was, there was a man that came by the church, um, and he was, he was you know, this is going to maybe scare some people, so I'll try not to dwell on it too much. But there was a demon-possessed man that came by the church. And... Um, I, at the time, me and, and Chuck were both, you know, spending a lot of time in prayer and, and, and the Bible and that kind of stuff. And so when he came, we had the wisdom to take care of it. Well, then, you know, fast forward a couple of years, and I was kind of going through a little bit of a lull, kind of a time of being bitter. And um, there was a spiteful person that was going here to the church, and I, uh, I just didn't have anything to draw from. So... Um, you know, I, 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 as I was dealing with this annoying person, I, I found myself getting more bitter. I started mudslinging. I started, uh, I, I got really depressed. I started withdrawing from people because I didn't have anything to draw from. I didn't have any riches to draw from. So um, another proverb, Proverbs 12.1, whoever loves discipline loves knowledge, but one who hates correction is stupid. Whew. Boy, oh boy, what a proverb, huh? Well, there's a few things. First off, they're stupid in two senses. First off, it's stupid to not learn, right? I mean, if somebody says, hey, I can teach you how to do that, and you say, no, well, you're going to be left in ignorance, right? So the person who re rejects discipline, they're, they're going to be stupid because they didn't take the time to learn. Okay, but then there's also another thing that people who don't learn, um, they, uh, let me say it differently. When there's someone who's stu who is stupid, they show themselves by not learning. You know what I mean? I, I, no, you can't tell me what to do. So, uh, and here it says, whoever loves discipline, I should kind of clarify that too. Uh, when it talks about loving discipline, it doesn't mean like, it more means in the sense of receiving it. 
if you receive discipline. That would be a good way of wording that. So um, some examples of this would be maybe a child who listens to a parent or a worker who learns to do something better by listening to their boss or someone who goes to classes or reads books, you know, to try and learn how to do something better. Um, these would all be good examples. Um, someone who is sinning or making stupid mistakes and someone comes by and talks to them and they listen, they, they listen to the person who took their time to correct them, that would be a good example of all this. You, they're loving discipline. So in all those examples that I gave, there's the, uh, there's the idea that somebody is imparting a knowledge that the person is receiving, right? And, uh, but I think it goes a little bit, um, a little bit more to that and how it applies to God. And I'll, I'll talk about that in just a second. But there was a story I was thinking of when I was, when I was reading this proverb. There was this, there was this woman who, who had this really nasty attitude. And uh, she was always talking bad about people in the church and out of the church. Just always, always, always. You know, always her mouth was going. And uh, then she kept trying to get her, get her kid to go to church. You know, oh, you need to get to church. Meanwhile, she spent the whole time talking bad about people in the church and, you know, gossiping and complaining and shooting her trap off. She never closed her mouth. She just kept going. And so the kid obviously saw that and he said, I don't want to go to church. There's a bunch of people like you, you know. So then she kept one, oh, you know, these just being rebellious and God's not answering my prayers. Well, it's like, no, you're shooting yourself in the foot and you are getting in the way of your own answered prayers. And um, so a couple different people in the church tried to, tried to bring correction and say, hey, you know, you, you really need to change your attitude. You know, the Bible talks a lot about, you know, keeping your mouth shut and having wisdom in the things that you say and how a fool gives full vent to his, to his anger, but, you know, a wise person kind of holds back. And, uh, well, she didn't want to hear it. And uh, obviously it didn't go well. Uh, she never learned, and that would be a good example of uh, she hated correction. Um, uh, so another thing that I was thinking of how this, how this power of applies, though, is the one who accepts trials and struggles in life from God. When you're going to go through, you're going to go through life, and there's going to be trials and struggles that come by, and God's going to use these different things to grow you and to change you and, and all these different things and speak to you and help you to see things you didn't see before and kind of help you to uh, maybe change a bad attitude that you, you didn't even realize you had. And... Um, if you take the time to accept that God is trying to teach something in you, that you do have to grow, and there is something from this that God wants you to learn, and then to go forward and learn it, you'll be a lot better off. The problem is when we go through struggles, we do this. Why me, God? Why is this happening to me? Instead of saying, I'm going through the struggle, what can you possibly teach me from, from this, God? What, what can I learn? Teach me. Um, like, you know, I, I mentioned the, the death of my son. There's a great example. God, why did my son die? Well, a better question, the one that actually gives an answer is, what can I learn from the death of my son? You see what I mean? It has a whole different mindset that goes with it. And it can actually lead you to a place of, uh, of healing. So uh, actually in, in uh, Proverbs 17.3, it says this, a crucible for silver and a smelter for gold. And the Lord is the tester of hearts. And the idea in that verse is that he is trying our hearts. He's testing us to see what's there and to show us what's there. But also, he's doing it to build character through the situations that we're going through. And uh, so I, I, this one speaks to me not just from how God teaches us, but also how people teach us. Whoever loves discipline loves knowledge. And once again, in our mind, we, we, are, we are absorbed with the cause and effect thing. Something bad is happening, find the cause. See what I mean? That, that, that's, that, that's how we all, we get wrapped up into that. And, and we start seeing discipline as like spankings, whether we're talking about from people or from God, God is punishing me. But discipline is more about an opportunity for growth. And the more you look at your problems as an opportunity for growth, the less um, devastating, the less devastating they will be. Proverbs 14.4, where there are no oxen, the feeding trough is clean but an abundant harvest comes through the strength of an ox. So anybody who, who, who farms, you know, ranches, they'll, they'll probably kind of get the general gist of this. Uh, you know, if you don't have any animals, there's nothing really to clean up, but if you do have animals, you get a lot of work done. I mean, it's a very simple concept. Um, so I'm going to give you three different ways this applies. First off, when a church is reaching people, when a church is, is, is reaching people, you're going to have the church getting dirty. You're going to have things getting broken. You're going to have conflicts. And, and messy situations like somebody stealing a, a cart at the food pantry. <laughs> you guys really did do a good job taking care of that. 
Um, it, those things don't happen in clubs. They keep it all good. You have to have certain things to be a member, and you know you get thrown out if you're too rowdy and all these different stuff. Well, the church really doesn't have uh, the luxury of being a club. It, it dies out. The, re the church has to be something that reaches people. And uh, so that would be an application of this. You know, it's a lot easier if you get rid of the oxen. Don't reach people. There's nothing to clean up. But if you reach people, there's a bigger harvest. So it's kind of one of those things where do you want everything your way or do you want to see people get saved and to know God? You can't have both. Yeah, we are here to reach people. So, yep. We've actually had a lot of people... You wouldn't believe it, Damien, but we've had a lot of people leave because we wouldn't stop. <laughs> well, if you guys would stop uh, having the people from the apartments, if you guys would stop doing this, if you guys would stop. We even had some people telling us how the Mexicans were the problem and we need to get rid of all of them. And I was like, oh, is that so? We had another guy who said that our problem was that we were allowing women to talk in the building. <laughs> and anyways... More of the story, all of these people who complain like these, they're, they're gone. They're gone. They wanted us to stop reaching people, and we didn't, and they're gone. We're not going to stop. Like, <laughs> Anyways, yeah, and it just, oh, my goodness. It embarrasses me to even say the things out loud because people are, well, do you believe that? No, no, I don't. I don't. <laughs> Anyways, another example of this proverb here is having children. You know, having kids is very, very messy. I tell you what, they never put anything back. They break everything. They eat all your food. Golly, <laughs> this is very messy. But it is very rewarding. It is very rewarding in here, in your heart, but also for what you can contribute uh, to their life and to their future. And uh, so they will go on to live a life that sometimes you get to enjoy. Sometimes things get kind of strained, and that doesn't happen like um, I know a lot of parents who are estranged from their children from drugs and that kind of stuff. And I'm not, not definitely not trying to downplay that. But there is, de there is still a reward that comes with it. And, uh, and much good comes from, from child rearing. And much good comes from it. And, uh, and while they live with you, it, it, it's definitely an adventure that you get to take on. And that's a good example of, you know, hey, where there are no children, the feeding trough is clean. But an abundant harvest comes to the strength of having children. You know, so a third example, uh, it's easier to do everything yourself. If you've ever been a boss, if you ever had your own company or anything like that, which I have, I have been a boss over a situation and it's easier to do everything yourself. But if you have employees, you can get more done. There's a lot of pastor friends that I have being a pastor myself. Uh, and they, uh, they try to do everything in the church themselves. They don't try to get other people involved or, you know, raise up leaders. No, they'll just do it all themselves. Well, as a result, they're running around 24-7 and not really getting anything ever done because they got to do it all themselves. Uh, Proverbs 14, 15, the inexperienced one believes anything, but the sensible one watches his steps. Now, when I read this, I was actually thinking about a news article that I had seen in the paper. Y you know, the news is always giving half-truths, and if you don't watch out, man, they'll have you believing some weird things. I was looking at the paper. I was looking at the news, and it said that scientists believe they have found this radio signal that comes from other life. That they have found proof of aliens. Okay, all right, so I read the article, and it goes on to say... The article was the, the title was completely bogus. What actually happened was there are signals that come that travel through space from different planets and that kind of stuff. The stars send out signals and so on and so forth. Well, there was a planet that was sending out a signal that could have potentially been um, a sign that life was possible to grow there, but where the planet was in the galaxy was not uh, conducive to, to life. So it's completely the opposite of what the title said. But it sounded good when you read the title. You know, and that's a good example. Uh, the inexperienced one, they just believe anything. Another example that I read from the paper, um, it, it was talking about the way that the government believes that there's, a, that there's an alien mothership in our solar system. So I read the article, and it turns out that one guy that works for the government said that he could imagine, Hypothetically speaking, he could imagine that there's an alien ship in our, in our solar. No proof. There's no, no, like, here's some evidence. No, nothing. He just said he could imagine it so. So then another newspaper about a week and a half later said, is the mothership already here? 
It's like, hold on. There is no mothership. <laughs> or if there is one, we haven't found any proof of it. And like, golly. This is how rumors get started. And this is why we can't have nice things. Golly, I tell you what. You know, uh, so, and some more examples besides the newspaper. Oh, the newspaper. Uh, you know, back in the day, they used to have, like, the gossip groups that you had to go to. Like, there'd be, like, some per somebody in town that, you know, they always had the latest gossip. Or you went to the saloon or the bar, and they had the latest gossip. Nowadays, you just go to the newspaper, and they just, whatever nonsense they can print, and, you know, oh, okay, I'll read this. Anyways, um, it's easy to fool a new employee. When, you've, when, you, when you're when you running a business, it's really easy to fool a new, new employee. You can tell them, oh, no, we do that. This is how we do things over here. And they'll believe you because they haven't been there long enough. And so you get to pull all kinds of pranks for their first couple of weeks. Um, young children. What were you going to say? Yeah. <laughs> I can picture you doing it. <laughs> Up in the tree. <laughs> uh, but... Uh, <laughs> But uh, young children, when you have kids, they're really easy to, 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 to fool. You know, oh, I got your nose. Do you really? <laughs> oh, no. Put it back. <laughs> uh, but a prudent, wise, sensible person, that's someone who's careful what, what they believe. You, you, they, they take care with what they believe. They don't just believe anything. Like you're, if somebody comes up to you and said, well, Ray did so-and-so. Maybe. I mean, I don't know if he did or not. Oh, no, I know he did. Well, good for you. I'm glad you're convinced, but I'm not convinced. The inexperienced one believes anything, but the sensible person, they watch yourself. Okay, maybe that happened, but I don't know. <laughs> uh, we'll have to wait and see. Uh, but uh, the, 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 so, the, so the prudent, the wise, the sensible person, he, he's careful what he believes and what he accepts, where he goes and what he says where he's going in life, his life direction, and he knows uh, how much he doesn't know. When I was a kid, I thought I knew everything. I really, I did. But every year that I get older, I just keep thinking, there's just so much I don't know. I don't know about this parenting. I don't know about my job. I don't know about that. I'm going to the different things of all the things I don't know. And, uh, well, you know, I think that, I think wisdom kind of comes with age where you kind of realize I don't know all the stuff that I thought I knew, and then as you get less, ex you get more experience, you become more sensible, and you start watching your steps a little bit closer. Proverbs sixteen thirty two, patience is better than power in controlling one's emotions and capturing a city. God, when I read that proverb, I didn't like that. I tried to just cross it out of my Bible, but it was in my other Bible, so it didn't really work. Uh, and that's because I'm not real big on patience. And I'm not real big on controlling my emotions either. If I'm mad, by gum, you're going to know that I'm mad. <laughs> I'm not real big on that stuff. And uh, here it says that patience is actually better than having power. And controlling one's emotions is better than capturing a city. Well, if I could just get these kids under control, if I could just be a better whatever it is that you do with your job. You're a worship leader, a pastor, a, a, what's it called when you do the drywall? Uh, I guess just drywall guy. That's, that's what it is now, drywall guy. What? Mutter. You know, a mutter, there you go. Uh, if I, 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 and here's the thing. You could always assert your power over others and make them submit. You can always do that. This is a real, real challenge when you're a parent. You can force your kids to do the right thing, but it doesn't teach them how to make decisions. And it doesn't get them respect. It gets them blind obedience. Now, if that's your goal, then that's fine. But if you're trying to teach your kids how to act like adults when they're not in your house anymore, well, then losing your temper and yelling at them is not going to do much. But being patient is better than that. And... Uh, well, that's hard. To, that's hard to. That's hard to get. And, and the thing that the thing that amazes me about patience is that life is filled with waiting. Life is really about waiting, isn't it? We go to the DMV. What do you do there? Wait. You go to the store. What do you do there? You wait. <laughs> you, you're driving somewhere. You are literally waiting to get to a place. That's what you're doing when you're driving. You're waiting. <laughs> you are going to sleep. You're waiting until the next day. You're going to work. You're waiting for the next guy to finish so you can get in there and do your job. Life is literally waiting. And uh, you know the thing that I. That, that I came to realize my, my nephew was in the stuck in the DMV <laughs> uh, the, yesterday. And something that I realized is that 
it's, life is full of waiting, but patience is learning to wait well. See, the person that's stuck in line is yelling and cursing. They're still waiting. They're just not waiting patiently. They're getting themselves all worked up, going to have a heart attack. They're still having to wait. <laughs> yelling and cursing, that didn't fix anything. Um, and it's, it's easy to spout and fume, but it's hard to control your emotions. That's yeah, real hard. That's real hard to do. But either way, you're going to have to wait. You might as well learn to be patient about it. There's something that God laid on my heart to do. And uh, so I did it. And uh, still waiting to see if it was right or wrong. I have, still, haven't seen the, whew, still haven't seen the consequences of it. But we're looking at I, almost three months now. And I still haven't had a yes or a no from the, from the thing. I mean, that's trying my patience. I'm more of like a one or two week kind of guy. Okay, I did this, God. Now show me. Is this going to work out or what? Was I wrong? Did I not really hear you after all? Give me my results so I can move on with my day. Meanwhile, God's more in this whole thing about teaching character and patience. And it's like, God, you're killing me. <laughs> what? Uh-huh. <laughs> man, oh, man, way to keep himself busy, right? So here's the thing. If you want to do something great, you want to leave a legacy, you want to be known for something, learn to control your emotions. Whether we're talking about anger or sorrow or anything else, learn to control your emotions. Because how you act and, and react to things, it, it impacts others with your example. You teach your kids more about how to be an adult by what you're doing than what you're saying. You can give them 100 different lectures, but it won't take as far as the example that you're doing. They will copy the traits that you do most often. If you help people most often, you're going to find them be bigger helpers. If you yell at people and lose your temper all the time, you're going to find them doing the same thing, giving you lip, talking back to you all the time, because that's what they see you do. See what I mean? And this takes me to an idea that I've learned myself, and I share it with the rest of you in case you haven't learned it. It, it doesn't do, anything, do any good to call yourself a Christian. That doesn't do any good. Well, that's not what I'm getting at, but that's true. Um, you have to actually spend time in prayer and spend time in reading the Bible. You actually have to, you know, you can't just, oh, I'm a Christian now, so I'm going to just not do anything and somehow magically change. Like, no, you just have to seek after God. You know, he does the work, yes, but you are also seeking him, like, you know. So not only does the way you control your emotions really uh, affect the example that you leave, like you're talking about, but also it means more than a thousand speeches. I mean, a lot, of, a lot of different things, books like written to pastors, for instance, will talk about the way that it doesn't nearly matter how good your sermons are if you're not actually spending time with the people. Because it, you, you rub off on people and you create a culture in the church that this is how we do things here. But if you're not there to establish this is how we do things here, they're going to come up with their own mind of this is how we do things here. And uh, anyways, so uh, another thing about patience is that doors will be opened that were always closed to you before that will open with patience. Um, there was a time when I was, uh, when I was um, under this other worship leader. This was back up in Edgewood when I lived there. <clears throat> and the pastor didn't trust me to, do, to lead the worship for the youth group um, just because I was young. And that, was, that was pretty much the reason. Uh, and, I mean, I don't blame him. I mean, I hadn't done anything necessarily to prove myself. And uh, so um, after time, though, passed, I kept staying faithful to it, and eventually they did give it to me. They eventually let me do it because I was patient. Another example that I was thinking of is uh, there were a lot of opportunities for me to leave this church with a bad attitude in the past. Really, there were just tons. There was always, you know, somebody cussing you out or something, you know, something bad happening. There's always a reason to leave with a bad attitude, always. You know, you're around other people for long enough, you're going to have a fight. There's this idea that if you go to church, everybody's going to get along all the time. It's just, that's bogus, bogus. You can't be around anybody and never fight. Like, that just doesn't even happen. Um, yeah, it doesn't even happen in families, yeah. I mean, think about the way that Jesus' disciples were arguing and fighting with each other. They were hanging out with the big man, and they were still arguing and fighting. I mean, I think that we have this unrealistic expectation. So uh, th th there's been a lot of opportunities for me to leave with a bad attitude, but I stayed, and because I stayed, I grew. 
that's how you grow is you you stick with you when there's a problem you stick through i mean think about your marriages right you're gonna have fights you're gonna have things you're gonna fall out of love whatever that means but if you stick with it and you ride the wave your marriage gets stronger or you can give up and it ends i mean either way you can do whichever one and uh you know either way that the, the time's still gonna pass by and so then i stayed i grew and what happened is i got better opportunities in the church than i would have had um Right now, I'm actually in the middle of a, a middle of a, a possible opportunity that would have been closed to me before. I can't share the details. I wish I could, guys. I will probably in a couple of weeks, but uh, nothing yet. Proverbs seventeen four. A wicked per and the, we just have two more proverbs we're going to look at. And I hope this is this is helping you to see how the Bible does apply to our lives. We just have to actually sit and think about it. You don't don't try and get through it as quick as you can. Just take your time. Sometimes it takes me 40 minutes to get through a chapter of Proverbs. Sometimes it only takes me five. However long it takes you to think about it. A wicked person listens to malicious talk. A liar pays attention to a destructive tongue. Now, here's the thing about that this, that this proverb has shown me. You can tell a lot about someone by the company that they keep. You can also tell a lot about someone by what they talk about when they're with that company and what they listen to. Oh, is this the kind of person who seems to always be around people who are causing problems? Chances are, they're, uh, they're a wicked person, a liar. That's what the proverb just said, right? If you see somebody who's always getting in, in, around problem people, what we do is we do this. If we like the person, we give them a free pass. It wasn't them, it was that other person. Well, they could have stopped and walked away at any time. <laughs> like They were equal partners in this. They should have stopped. If you're not going to say anything against it, then at least walk away. At least. Um, I, I tell you what, the problem is, is I, I, I'm kind of a slow thinker sometimes. So there'll be somebody who says something. Um, this just happened last week. And, and they said something I didn't think much about. It. I was like, oh, I was kind of rude to that person. Uh, what were you saying? And then I wish I hadn't because when I said what were you saying, they went out and they proceeded to then gossip about this person. And I was like, ah. Uh, what? Like, I was just blown away that this person was gossiping about this person. I thought they were like best friends. So I was trying to wrap my head around the fact that they were gossiping. Uh, and I couldn't even think of what to say. I was just like, uh, uh, it was like it was right before service. I was just like, uh, okay. So I was all st starting to walk away because I was like, well, I don't really know you very good. Why are you like, I barely even knew this person. And they're like unloading every problem that they had with this person. I was just like, uh, what do I do here? And I couldn't think of what to do, so I started kind of edging away because I couldn't think of what else to do. Now that, I mean, when I, afterwards, I was in my shower, you know, I was like, oh, that's what I should have said, you know. <laughs> I knew all the ways to, to say all the smart things then, but I couldn't think of what to say there. So I was just edging away, and I was like, oh. And that's going to happen. Sometimes you're just going to be caught off guard. Um, I'm just really surprised. That I thought that they were like this, you know, and now they're unloading on me. I was like, oh. I think I can handle it easier when someone's cussing me out than when they just suddenly start gossiping about their homeboy. I'm just like, oh, oh, oh. <laughs> so I, I never get close to people who have bad attitudes that they won't resolve because this is what we do. I can change them. I can fix them. I can go and make this person where they're going to get back. No, no, you can't. Okay, no, they can't. If they're not going to make that decision by themselves, if they're not going to listen to the Holy Spirit touching their heart, they're not going to listen to you. Like, <laughs> You can still be a good example from a distance, but bad co company corrupts good morals. Um, and here's the thing. If they did it to them, they will do it to you. And I'm talking about like gossip. If they're gossiping, Norval, Ray did this thing. Well, you can guarantee that I'm going to be talking behind your back too. If, I, if I'm willing to talk to you about Ray, I'm willing to talk to them about you. That's just the way people think. And, uh, you know, I was, I was once a friend with this guy. And... Uh, uh, he he uh, he always got in these conflicts with people. Like he had uh, two or three wives, and he always divorced them just on a whim. You know, always got mad and upset at people. Always had conflicts with people. Uh, went in the office and yelled at the pastor one time, and just all kinds of different things. And um, I kept thinking, no, he's changed now, and you know, whatever. And uh, then eventually, on down down the road, after you know, I had seen him time and time again chew people up and spit them out. He did the same thing to me. And did you know that I was surprised when it happened? He wouldn't have done it to me. Now, why wouldn't he have done it to you? Because we were friends. Okay. <laughs> Here's the thing, and, and, and I hope that this, that this helps you, okay? 
You can't be surprised when someone acts according to their character. I know somebody who's a, who, who's a user, and, I, and he lies about everything. He makes up these stories all the time. I'm not surprised anymore, especially when he's on drugs. I know. I know. Whatever he says, it might, he might be very convincing, but it's not going to be true. So you just kind of go along, okay, yeah, yeah. I'm sure you said that, and that cop was just an idiot, and that they didn't really have evidence, and they planted that in your, in your house. Yeah, I'm sure that all that happened. Yeah, but it's not, it didn't really happen, you know what I mean? Like, okay. You know, let them talk, you know. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, you know, I'm not surprised that it's a lie because you can't be surprised when people act according to their character. So if somebody has a proven character and somebody else comes in and says, that person did this, the first thing you, sh you should think is, I know that person, though. I'll give you a good example. I know the kind of person pastor is. There's a lot of people who try to come up to me and say about how pastor did this and this and that and that and I know right off the bat that probably didn't happen. There was a woman here who was a who was a Wiccan, and she did a lot of different um, different like you know rituals and stuff and magic and that kind of stuff. And uh, she uh, she always used to talk to demons and whatnot. And one time she came to something that I was teaching. I forget what it was. And she was telling about how um, Pastor had said something and made it sound like Pastor was gossiping with her about her mom. And I was like. Pastor was gossiping with you about your mom. He doesn't know her mom. He's not that close with her, and he doesn't gossip. I know him, so I was very surprised that she was claiming that he was acting out of character. But the problem is a lot of times, it, and he didn't really do those things. It, it was a lie. Just I, I didn't say that in the story. I want to clarify that Pastor didn't do those things. Um, and... Uh, uh, so a lot of times we get surprised and, and we just go after whatever nonsense somebody says. Okay, yeah, you said that Norval did that. I'm going to believe you. Why? <laughs> Why should you believe that? Uh, you can't be surprised when people act according to their character. The only people who are going to listen the, to the bad kinds of things about you are people you don't really want around you anyways. I remember there was a time when we were, start, we were going to start a men's center here. It was going to help guys to get off drugs. Okay. Which, who wouldn't want that? That's a better community, a stronger community, less drugs, less kids getting, getting to drugs. I mean, it sounds like a win for everybody, right? No, it was not. <laughs> Actually, uh, you guys remember the cartoon Beauty and the Beast? At the very end, they start getting the mob together, and they, they come to, to kill the beast. And he's like, oh, to the beast! You know, and they're singing their song with the lanterns. And that's kind of what it felt like. It kind of felt like the whole community was there to have like a pitchfork kind of thing, like we were an ogre or something. And, uh, uh, you know, that, that's just a... <laughs> the, the, the people who were going around saying those things were people who weren't with us anyways. And uh, so, you know, we got real upset there for a while because, you know, some people went from that and they were, oh, that pastor, he's no good, he did, do, 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 do. But the only people who were listening to those people were, were, were people who had probably should have, you know, they weren't on our side anyways, and they never really learned to close their mouth anyways. Um, one of them was a, was actually a state cop, if you can believe that. And uh, another one was a board member that shouldn't have been a board member. And, uh, you know, this whole thing, and they weren't, they didn't have pastors back anyways, you know, and then that whole thing blew up, and they found each other. How did they find each other? They just have a way of doing these things. <laughs> So uh, there's another uh, another one, another story that I can think of. There was a woman who, she hopped from church to church, and she always had bad things to say about the, the church that she just left. And uh, uh, so she was saying uh, bad things about us and about this church, and she still actually is now to this day. And uh, But here's the thing. She does this, and she finds others who do it as well. I'm not overly concerned about it because people who know our reputation – they know that we don't do those things that that woman's claiming that we do. And um, she was actually able to get uh, get this other woman to stop coming to this church. Um, this and that that other woman knows the history of this of this woman. She she still decided to go with that woman to another church. And I didn't try to talk her out of it because those kinds of people are they're they're problems waiting to happen. You know what I mean? You can beg them to stay, and I've actually done this with people before. You try, you do, do everything in your power to get them to stay. You beg, you, 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 you meet them in the middle, you, you do whatever, 
And eventually they leave anyways with a bad attitude. There's nothing you can do. When somebody has their mind made up to leave, there's, there's nothing. You just keep doing the right thing. And when you make a mistake, you own up to it and say, you know what, I messed up. I'm sorry. And then you keep moving on. And, uh, you know, the people who have your back will have your back. And the people who are waiting for you to slip, they won't have your back. And the people who talk bad about you, they're going to talk bad anyways. And the people who are going to listen, they would have listened anyway. So <laughs> it really comes down to that. So at all, we can all summarize everything that I just said with this proverb. A wicked person listens to malicious talk. A liar pays attention to destructive tongue. It's almost like Solomon knew what he was talking about, you know, 3,000 years ago. So the last proverb we're going to look at is this one, 19.2. Enthusiasm without knowledge is no good. Haste makes mistakes. So what we do in life is we get in a hurry. We try to get a bunch done. Got to get it done now. We got to get it done yesterday. And don't believe me, just look at tax season, right? You want to do taxes at the same time that you're doing all these other things and get everything done. And, but then we end up making it worse, don't we? We try to get it done yesterday. We just make it worse. I remember when we used to work construction, uh, my dad would have to, you know, plan the days out like this. Bam, 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 bam. So everybody could get in, get out. We could go back in. That's how you build houses. But sometimes we got in such a hurry to get in there that the inspection still wasn't done. And so we were actually just wasting everybody's time because we still didn't have it. And, well, I knew that the inspection was going to come through on that day, but it didn't. So I mean, haste makes mistakes. And there's been numerous times here at this church that we wanted to start this or that and, 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 and got the wrong people doing the wrong thing at the wrong time. Some people have asked us, well, whatever happened with the men's center? I think it's still going to happen. I really do. I think it's still, it's still coming. But here's the thing. Here's the thing. We're going to take the time to do it right this time. Because the people who we had helping us in the men's center before, it was the wrong people. And they were in the wrong position. You know what I mean? And it played itself out. Thankfully, it played itself out before we opened the men's center. Because I tell you what, <laughs> if that would have played itself out afterwards, we would have had a whole bunch of guys coming for help. They would have been right back, and the community would have gotten even madder at us for that. I tell you what. Yep, it would have been a disaster. Uh, another example is uh, we were talking about adoption before the service. I was in such a hurry to adopt because, you know, kids are out there that really need help. So I was really, really in, 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 in such a rush. Hurry. And I'm not saying adoption was wrong. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying I was in too big of a hurry, and I didn't take the time to learn about special needs children. Did you know that when a child is in the womb and they have drug exposure, that their brain doesn't think exactly the same as other people's brains do? Well, if you don't know that and you don't know how to correctly talk with them and how to correctly teach them, you're going to get so mad that you're going to be spitting fire. It's one of those things. <laughs> you better make sure you know what you're putting in your mouth before you take a bite. I mean, it, you, you can't because once you adopt, I mean, it's there. You, you can't just, here, take this back so I can learn what I should have learned before. Um uh, when I was a kid, I, I was in such a hurry. I had to hurry up and get going on my life, get married, buy a house. And I'm not saying that getting married was a mistake. That's not what I'm saying. But I made a lot of mistakes in that process and spent more money and time on things than I should have. Um, a lot of times, for instance, I would buy something because I was in such a hurry to buy it. I bought my first house when I was uh, 20 or 20 to 22, somewhere in there. I don't remember. I bought my first house somewhere in there, and it was, it was for the price it was good, and I was able to resell it for a lot more, so it worked out. It worked out. But it worked out because God was behind it working out. And I want to get that across because I, I, didn't do the, I didn't do the right stuff. I should have stayed for longer so I could have bought a nicer house in a nicer neighborhood. I didn't. I was in such a hurry to buy a house, I bought a house in the slums. And as a result, I had to live in some kind of dangerous situations sometimes. <laughs> and then I moved to Tularosa. And, uh, <clears throat> but the story being, it was years before I was able to sell it. So I had to rent it out. And oh boy, if you've never been a landlord, let me tell you, it's a pain in the butt. Now, I know that renters, you know, life is hard. I get that. But I tell you what, hooey, it's hard being the landlord. You've got a mortgage to cover. You've got to fix everything. And at the same time, every renter thinks that you're just out for the money. Every single one of them. So you're trying to be a Christian and trying to do the right thing while you're trying to keep yourself from complete bankruptcy. And I tell you, it's just too much, too much to worry about. 
And that wouldn't have happened if I would have just slow, slowed down and done it right. Slow down and done it right. That, uh, yeah, what do you say, be still and know that I'm God? Is that what you just said? Yeah, absolutely. That sign out by the road. Okay, let me tell you the history of that sign. We got some people who said, you need to get a sign. You need to get a sign. So oh, not this one, that one. The one that has the letters on it. Okay. Um, you need to buy a sign. You need to buy. So, okay, all right, we buy a sign. Now nobody wants to put it up. So now it just gets to be a constant annoyance because we're tripping over it. Nobody's being up. So finally, without communicating to anybody, I go out there and I set it up myself. And they didn't like the way I set it up. So then, right after I do it, somebody else goes out there and has a better idea, and they set it up too. Once again, without communicating, they just, everybody's just doing whatever they want to do. And they just everybody's just in such a hurry to get it done now because they're just irritated with it. So then it gets put up there, and, uh, well, it was ugly as sin. It was on a pickup, pickup bed, and it was just uglier, uglier than, I mean, it was just ugly. It was nasty. And it stayed there. Until finally we were able to put it up the right way on a metal stand that looks nice out there, doesn't blow around all the time, with a cover where the, livers, where the letters don't blow off all the time. If we would have taken the time to do it right in the first place, we wouldn't have had to set it up two different, three different times. Enthusiasm without knowledge is not good. Make sure everybody knows what they're doing. Communicate. Haste makes mistakes. I mean, you see, you see parents doing this all the time, right? Just talk to each other and figure out what you're doing before you start whipping out the punishments, guys. <laughs> Haste makes mistakes. Your kid does something stupid. Well, I got to get on top of that. So you give a punishment that's either too harsh or not harsh enough or just blow, blow off or whatever, and it doesn't work out. Haste makes mistakes. Take time to stop and think for a second. It's not a race. Life is not a race. Just cool your jets. It's all right. Uh, I remember numerous times that I bought a book. And find, I found that I didn't really like it after I bought it. Well, that's a waste of money. I was in such a hurry to buy the book, it wasn't even a book I liked. See what I mean? 